Okay. So, guys, first off, thanks for spending some time with us today. Uh, we have a panel conversation this afternoon on building uh, impactful workplaces. And I think diversity plays a huge role in that. And so what I'd like to do first is just have you guys spend a minute introducing yourselves, and then we'll jump right into the questions. All right, so Anthony, you want to go first? Um, I'm Anthony. I'm a tech evangelist and software engineer at Microsoft. Um, also an entrepreneur. Um, I was head of engineering at an incubator here in LA and founded a few startups. Um, my latest startup was a company called Showkit, which was solving the issue of customer support and mobile apps. Um, ended up selling that, that company in 2015. And I've been with Microsoft for about six months. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Porter Braswell, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Jopwell. And Jopwell is an online community of black, Latino, Hispanic, and Native Americans, and we help with career advancement. Hi, everyone. My name is Kwejo Nyaku. I'm a tech evangelist here at Microsoft. Um, before Microsoft, I was at Shipmate, which was a Y Combinator startup last year. And Shipmate is a peer-to-peer -peer company that helps people in Ghana and Nigeria get items from the US. Great. So thanks again for being here, all of you. Um, the first question I want to lead off with today was, building high-performance teams is harder than it sounds. Everyone wants to do it. But bringing people together and trying to get the most out of them is hard. So in your experiences, what has it been like when you've been building your startups to, to build high-performance teams, and how important is diversity in that? Um, okay. Sorry, first. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, bringing different perspectives and backgrounds together is very, very important um, in solving issues. I mean, we build teams to solve problems, and those problems can span different groups of people, you know, different races, um, different genders, um, people that are um, disabled. So it's very important to have, you know, build a team with those different perspectives because you come up with solutions that, you know, you might not have come up with with a group that has the same kind of mindset. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, diversity is the cornerstone for Jopwell. <clears throat> so we practice what we preach. Our company is incredibly diverse. We have every walk of life. We have every skin color, every sexual orientation you can imagine. And it's with a differing of experiences and thoughts that people bring to the table um, that makes our company and companies at scale, um, you know, amazing places not only to work, but companies that solve true problems. If you don't have a workforce that's representative of, of communities in which your product's gonna be shipped in and whatnot, I, I, I fundamentally do not understand how people miss the mark on, on, on such a critical element uh, that is diversity. And so um, it's a cornerstone for our business and, and working with a lot of companies that we work with from tech to finance to healthcare, um, the one thing that we see consistently across the board is that um, the companies that are more diverse and have a strategy in place to, consi to consistently have a pipeline of diverse applicants coming through are the best within their industry. So um, it's incredibly important, and, um, and again, it's a cornerstone for us. So, Yeah, so when running a company, you can't really predict what's going to happen, right? You might have a business that's doing well today in two years or maybe in a shorter time. In one month, the landscape might change. So in order to make sure your company is going to be relevant, you need a high-performing team. And how else can you build a high-performing high team? Well, you need a diverse workforce, diverse group of people, because that means you have diversity in thought, diversity in experiences, diversity in background. It enables you to look at problems from many different angles and come up with very innovative solutions so your company can remain innovative and tackle whatever issue comes your way. So that's excellent. Um, Porter, I wanted to kind of dig deep a little bit on what you had said. With Jopo, the mission is really about curating a diverse community of talent. And you've been on the front line of delivering that yourself. What's, what's that journey been like? And, and how have you seen corporate America sort of evolve now? Yeah, so the journey of starting Jopo, um, uh, let's see. Well, one, my parents were totally against it. They said, I, at the time I was working on Wall Street and um, I spent five summers starting in high school working um, on Wall Street. And so I had the dream job. I was buying and selling currencies for an amazing company and, 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 and I achieved what my parents would define as being success. And so when I told them that I was gonna quit to A, start a company and B, start a company focused just on diversity, um, just on diversity, my parents said to me, okay, so let's get this straight. So you're non-technical. 
you've never started a company, and you know nothing about recruiting, and that's gonna be the business that you're gonna build and leave the job that you're leaving. And I said, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. And they say, okay, good luck, you're gonna fail, and, but you, know, you can go back to school if that happens. And so it was a really awkward thing to go against my parents, um, and it was a really awkward thing to have somebody who you love and who you look up to tell you like you are going to fail um, and still do it. And so, um, now, you know, they, uh, they, they, uh, they regret saying that, but, um, but the founding Jopwell and being a person of color while doing it, it's a really, it could be a truly isolating experience, I'm sure, as, as we all know. And so um, when you push through that, amazing opportunities happen. And so the story of Jopwell, my co-founder and I had really similar backgrounds. We looked at each other, we said, it doesn't matter, we're going to do this. We did it, went through um, a lot of highs, a lot of really amazing things, and you know, also went through Y Combinator. Um, we did a seed round about a year and a half ago where we raised like, think like four and a half million dollars and, and, and the business is growing and we're now 25 people. So, so I am so glad that I pushed through that, but it was an incredibly lonely, awkward feeling at first to start a business. So I'm gonna switch up the, uh, we, we have some questions I was gonna ask, but I wanted to poke on something if I can. There's a lot of press today in corporate America about diversity, how important it is. And you could argue that some, some corporate American entities are doing diversity to check the mark, right? Like, hey, we're diverse. But they're really, it's really not a mission. It's really not something that's in the fiber of that organization. If you were to talk to C-level folks at, at corporate America about changing their mindset, what advice would you all give them? It's not just about checking a box. I think it's more than that. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So in terms of advice to corporate America about changing their mindset towards diversity, one of them, so there are two things. The first thing, obviously, to put more money and to look at platforms that are actually helping with solving the diversity issue. So like Joppa is a great platform. If you're a C-level exec, you don't know how to get my, more minorities into your company, well, someone is solving the problem for you. Go get engaged with them. The second uh, thing I would talk about is to look inside, look inward in your company and make sure you're also giving attention and giving resources to the people who are minorities inside of your company and giving them a platform. As an entrepreneur, one of the ways where my company has got customers is we do referrals. If we have a really, really good product, our, our um, customers become our own advocates. They go and they tell other people to come and look at Shiftmate. So the same way, if you want your workforce, your employees, your company to be diverse, you need to make sure the people who currently work there who are minorities actually know that you care about them, actually know that you value their background, their experiences, their differences, and that will make them go out and also advocate for you. I would say three things. The first one is that it takes time and that if your company is not diverse, you're not going to be diverse within a year or two or five. It's just going to take time, especially the larger um, company. Uh, you know, the larger companies will take long, longer periods of time, of course. Uh, number two is I would say start early and have early entry level pipelines to freshmen in college, high school, high school students. I started working at Morgan Stanley when I was in high school for two summers and, and then my freshman year onwards, I was at Goldman Sachs. And so starting early is a really important thing. Um, and then I would say the third thing is define diversity. Diversity is this massive umbrella and basically everybody is diverse. You can make an argument. And so I think companies really need to focus on like what the pain points are. Is it black, Latino, Hispanic, and Native Americans that you're trying to solve for? And if it is, then, then label it as such and go after it. And so I think the more intentional a, a company can be about what they mean by diverse um, and have that uncomfortable conversation um, is like a necessary thing to, move, to start moving the ball. Yeah, I think they hit it on the head. I, I would just piggyback off of that, saying that um, I would I would say, you know, tell executives to to be involved in events like this. Um, also, look in places that aren't normally looked at, like HBCUs. Um, I mean, they have great engineering schools. They have a lot of talent, um, and they're overlooked. Um, there's organizations like Nesby um, out there as well. Become involved with those type of organizations because there's a lot of talent out there, a lot of diverse talent. Um, Okay, do um, you guys have any questions you want to ask at all? Switch it up a little bit, yep. Um, so I have a question for you. Um, so our team is pretty, our team is pretty diverse. Um, so how did you go about, you know, making that happen? Um, yeah, so um, we're the, 
we're the Microsoft for startup team for Microsoft here in the US. And uh, when I joined the team back in 2014, we had six members and we've grown it now to 13. Six, or sorry, seven of our employees are diverse. Four women and, um, and three diverse candidates. And so for me, it was important because so much of what you all do in the startup ecosystem is around people engagements. You're all building amazing products and you want to get into amazing markets. But at the end of the day, it's what people matter the most. And so for me, I wasn't looking for the atypical developer. I was looking for someone that is deep in community and that brought diverse perspectives to, to, to the table. And for Microsoft, as big as Microsoft's been, and, and for the legacy that Microsoft brings to the table, we're 40 plus years old, I wanted fresh thinking on this team. And so that's what we did. And we brought Anthony on board six months ago, thanks to yourself, Porter, and then Guangzhou just recently joined us in, in January, and we've already thrown him in the fire with us. Um, and so having the diversity on my team was really important because I think to be relevant in this space with developers, you have to have that perspective. You just can't do it. And so I'm super proud of the diversity that we've built in our team. And uh, once our collective manager frees up additional heads, we'll be doing the same on our side. So that's why. My question would be for the two of you, how did you break into tech? Because my way of breaking in into tech was starting a business, but I, I had no clue otherwise how to get into it. So how did you guys go about it? Um, I got exposed to tech really, really early. Uh, my father was in IT, so he would bring home computers all the time, and I would break them and uh, figure out how to put them back together. I started coding really early. Um, and just, you know, one of my, my first jobs was actually working at a web design firm. I was just really, really into tech. Um, and I uh, graduated from USC with a computer science degree, um, and then went into the industry, um, worked for DOD, work, um, building technologies for the military. And um, I got into entrepreneurship um, after that um, by becoming head of engineering at an incubator. And so there I learned how to put together, you know, put products together and launch products and, and, and things like that. So I learned more of the business side of things and um, product development. And then um, that incubator was actually the first investor in my company, Showkit. Um, so that was kind of the pro quick progression of how I got to this point. So I, I studied computer science in school. Um, I have, I'm the youngest of four, and all of my siblings are into medicine and healthcare, so doctors and pharmacists. So when I was declaring my major, my dad actually wanted me to study chemistry or biology and eventually go be a doctor. But from an early age, when I was younger, I'd watch Knight Rider, and I was just really, really interested in that show. Um, I wanted to grow up, get a car that could drive itself around, I got into college and I went to MIT, so seeing people build robots and all these kind of really, really cool, interesting things. So for me, it was more of I was just always interested and fascinated with it, and I just took a chance and took a programming class, and I was like, wow, I, I like this stuff. It gives me so much control to build things. And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna study computer science. And from there, I just kept going and going and going. Cool, so we have a little bit of time left over in our session. I wanted to open up to any questions that may come out of the crowd. So if you have any questions, we'd love to hear from them, or else I've got more. You got one? Yeah. I mean, does being diverse necessarily have to do with race, or does it more have to do, because I know people who are of certain races who are, could be quote unquote extremely diverse, but only know that section of their life, right? And I know people who could be called the most undiverse people in the world by the way they look, but are very well versed in terms of culture, understanding socioeconomic issues and things like that. So can you guys touch on that a little bit? Um, this definition of diversity, uh, you spoke about defining it. What's that definition for you guys? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great question. So I think, I think you are diverse. <laughs> I, think, I think diversity, again, is this massive umbrella. And I think that it, it includes underneath it um, ethnicities, sexual orientation, um, experiences, socioeconomic backgrounds. I think diversity um, is a huge umbrella. Um, and so how Joppel defines it is black, Latino, Hispanic, and Native Americans, because as a business, we want to focus on one thing and do it incredibly well. And so I think that um, that's just what we have, have decided to solve for. Um, but um, diversity is a massive thing, and so I think that everything, um, ex everything comes into being a diverse individual. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so just to give an example, diversity is quite large, quite huge, and it's not just ethnicity or race. So in my company, Shipmate, 
Um, there are four of us, four co-founders, we're all black males, and there are things about the customers who we serve that I have no idea about. I don't understand it, right? But we, you can say we're serving, so right now we serve Ghana and Nigeria, mostly Ghana. I'm Ghanaian, but there are things about Ghanaians that I don't understand as a Ghanaian. So if you limit diversity to like race or ethnicity, you'll fall short. But my, my co-founders are Nigerian, yet there are things that they understand deeply about the customers that I don't understand. So it's about experiences, it's about backgrounds, it's just a really large umbrella. And that's why being diverse is important because you realize you have to be able to have empathy with your customers if you're building for the customers. You want people to love the things you're building, love your products, you need empathy for that. I think it's a great question. From my standpoint, I think we're all packaged differently. And, and because of our heritages, our, our race, our ethnicities, where we've come from, um, I think it's important for people to not look at a package as much as it is the creativity, the insights, the empathy that you bring to the table. I think that's, Matt, that's, that's what matters. Um, I grew up uh, in an immigrant family. My, my dad had immigrated from Greece. My mom immigrated from Greece to Canada. They, they met in Canada, and, and I grew up in a, in a world where it was all about Greeks, and, and that was the only community that I could be part of. You can't do that in Toronto. Toronto, is a high, if you've ever been there, it's a highly multicultural um, community, more so than anywhere else that I've seen here in the U.S. And so I've always respected the, the fact that people come from different walks of life and that everyone has something interesting to bring to the table all the time. And so that's how I look at it, and I think that's important. Um, any other questions? Shoot. I guess my question is to Porter. Um, can you speak on how you took your company from the point of like your parents disagreeing with it to the funding? I mean, was it difficult getting companies to believe in what you were trying to do or what was that, that, that journey for you? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so as I mentioned, I'm non-technical and so is my co-founder. So for us, uh, all we could do was sell when we first started. So we got into this little box of a room when we, on day one and we looked at each other and said, basically, now what? And we couldn't build a platform, so we said, let's make a presentation, because we're really good at that. And then, so we got a great presentation, talked about what the vision of Joppel is going to be, started pitching to companies. Companies said, yes, if you can build that, we'll be there as a partner. Once we had a couple of big companies basically say, yes, we will partner with you, we then leveraged that, went to investors, friends and family and, and, and networks, and basically said, we have these companies, we have no platform, but if you fund us, we'll go out and build it. And we got incredibly fortunate, and we raised $500,000 pretty quickly, got that money, started hiring technical people, company came together, started building the platform, those companies were there that said that they would be there, got users, started creating this two-sided effect, started growing from there, had some amazing traction, got into Y Combinator, and uh, you know, a year and a half later, so. Porter, I'm going to ask another question on top of that. What advice would you give to people? Normally, when you ideate a company, you think it's the best idea in the world. In most cases, it is. But then you go through this dark period, right, where it's like, shit, I, I can't keep eating Kraft Dinner and cheese every night, and no one's picking up this idea. So what, what's your advice, which is not a non-diversity question, but what's your advice for folks that are going through that period as their companies are growing? Yeah, I, I, so, so I can't lose. I hate losing more than... I, like, so for me, like going through that period is just you keep grinding, you keep going, you keep pushing forward and, and you become oblivious to the fact that like you're not killing it and like ignorance is bliss. And so it doesn't matter what's going on around you. If you're grinding and you're like, no, this has to work out, it's going to work out. But I think it takes a certain mindset to, to not recognize failure. Like I failed I feel, I feel every day, multiple times every day, but I don't recognize it as failure. And so, again, I live in like this like completely bliss world because I don't recognize the challenges that are in front of me because I'm just focused on grinding and grinding and grinding. And so all companies definitely go through that lull. Paul Graham has a really good essay about that, actually. And um, I think the companies that kind of get out of that are people that are solving a true problem. They're not in it to make money. They're not in it for anything other than solving that problem. And, uh, and you keep pushing forward, so. I can add on to that, too. Um, yeah, if, as a founder, meet with other founders. Um, you gotta just break bread, you know, like on a weekly basis and, and be able to vent to each other. I mean, you know, we are, we're all doing this together and we, we run into some of the similar challenges and it's good to be able to, to like get that off your chest and, and know that someone else can identify and is going through the same things. So, just a 
And just to quickly add to that, um, I think entrepreneurs should keep in mind that you aren't meant to solve every problem. You aren't meant to jump on every idea that sounds like it's a great idea. You aren't meant to solve or start the company because you think it's gonna be a billion dollar company, but you should follow your passion. You need to go after those things that make you stay up at nighttime, that you just can't stop thinking about it. And when things get difficult, you don't, you don't really focus on it. You can't even, you can't imagine yourself doing anything else. So the difficulty is just part of it and you sort of enjoy it. So I would say like, just make sure you, you, you go off your passion. Last question. So considering that uh, most of the titles here say evangelist, um, you know, what? with the advent of the internet, it gave people that had an unheard voice a lot of uh, power and uh, ability to communicate with each other, kind of the open source culture. Uh, what do you foresee with the blockchain as in providing capital to those who do not have access and uh, other issues such as like M-Pesa and BitPesa. Sorry if it's too technical. <laughs> no, I think, you, I think you hit that one square. I'll, I'll take a start and then I need you guys to back me up if I'm floundering. I'm non-technical, remember that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so three minutes left. I think if you go back in the Valley specifically, back in the, what, 70s? When startups started in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and, and close to the early 2000s, starting meant buying racks of gear of servers and networking and building stuff. The cloud has flattened that world, right? So that's, that's the first thing. The second is funding has changed. The landscape has changed. It hasn't really titanically changed, but there's undercurrents. Um, so there's crowdfunding sites like Indiegogo and Kickstarter that are fundamentally changing some of those landscapes. I think what we have seen at Microsoft is that the, the pervasiveness of new technologies like open source has been around for years, has fundamentally changed the rules. And, and for, from our standpoint, from my standpoint, I think playing by those rules and finding out where you can add your value is gonna make sense. Now, for someone who's starting a company that's looking at how do I fundraise, that world has gotten flat. Um, we, we see angel associations out of Seattle, like Seattle Angels, who are doing deals in, in, in New York City and in other, uh, in other cities, something that maybe would have not happened five years ago. Um, I think to, to everyone that's spoken here, if you've got a great business plan, you've got some initial traction, you can show an investor that this is working, there's a market. Um, there's investors out there that'll, that'll hear you out. That's my perspective on it. Blockchain's another really interesting thing that I think we're all starting to learn more about, um, but I don't know how that's gonna play in their investment world. I'm not sure if people will invest with Bitcoins just yet, but you know, real. All right, I think we're good, so great question. So I'd like to give a heartfelt uh, thanks to my colleagues and to Porter for, for coming. Porter had flown out here from New York City, as did Guangzhou, so thank you both for making the 3,000-mile trek.